So what we are just going to um, talk about now is the word aleinu. Aleinu. Translated, it means it is our duty. So we've rec recited it countless times. And even though we translate this phrase as it is our duty, perhaps we don't take it all that personally. Whose duty mine? What? It doesn't dawn on us that um, this duty is about doing something. We have a duty to do something. So what exactly is it that we're supposed to do? Now, the Avodraham, whose uh, bio and context we shared last week um, in detail in our introduction, um, 14th century Spanish commentator, tells us that it is our duty. It means we are obligated. There's an obligation here to praise the master of everything, le shaber l'adon hakol, and I'm going to take those words separately in the next part, but now we're dealing just with aleno. And if we don't experience this as a serious obligation, then we'll spoil the very thing that we're about to do, which is le shaber l'adon hakol, which is to praise God. And as we'll discover, Aleinu is centrally a compilation of praises to God. The rabbis, as we know, describe prayer as avodat lev, service of the heart. Uh, if the heart is missing from our prayer, it's likely the mind won't show up either. So the heart is the motivating factor. So why is it such an important duty to express these praises contained in Aleinu? It's not only a matter of showing gratitude to God. It's much more than this. The word Aleinu means that we, as Jews, have a unique obligation to testify to Hashem's oneness. And throughout history, and we spoke about this uh, again in the introduction, uh, where Moshe Rabbeinu, after the sin of the golden calf, the Chet HaEgel HaZahav, and <clears throat> when the, excuse me, when the Bnei Israel do Teshuvah for that chet, Moshe Rabbeinu begs HaKadosh Baruch Hu v'niflenu mikol ha'am, please distinguish us, separate us, make us unique from the other nations of the world. Because now we've participated in something that they have done. Now we've participated in idol worship. And so let us come back to being unique to your oneness. So throughout history, human beings have failed to perceive God's oneness. Because human beings have developed ideologies, even in 2020, that prevent them from perceiving the Yad Hashem, God's hand in nature and in history. And they look at it as the product of mankind, the things that happen. And if you remember in our introduction, we spoke about how important uh, Yehoshua felt, Yehoshua ben Nun, as the Bnei Israel were coming into Eretz HaKadosh to evoke words which have been formulated into the Aleinu prayer to remind the Jews that they were a nation unique to God. And they had chosen that. It wasn't that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had chosen this people. It was the people had chosen HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And um, also um, Yohanan ben Zakkai, in the second Bet HaMikdash, formulated Aleinu 
to remind the Jews that they were going out of this sanctuary, this Israel, this unified space, this uh, holy space, and they were going out in the destruction of the second temple to be amongst the nations. And they were going to be very different from those nations, always uh, having an eye on um, political or economic or social um, achievements, God could become de-emphasized in their lives as they competed with those nations. And so Aleno has been said at times, when we have been, um, our focus has been redirected to other powers and other things, as it is very much in 2020. So another reason um, for um, the destruction of the temple and the Jews' exile from Eretz Israel is that God's presence in the world has been highly concealed. And that's why we invoke the wholeness, the unity, the control of Hashem. And we speak about this. We, the Jewish people, are the only ones who have been given the privilege at the moment to see what's really taking place. And we do this through the lens of our faith, based on the testimony, and that's our historic testimony of the Torah, and our appreciation of God's revelations to the Jewish people. So as we spoke about in the introduction, this is our historical narrative. Every ethnic people, every race, every creed has its own narrative. And this is not to belittle others, but we are talking about ours. So now we can begin to understand why Aleinu, it is our duty to praise God as the master of everything and to ascribe greatness to God who created the world. Not only is the obligation to declare these truths to ourselves, but also to the world at large. And there's interesting commentary which we'll reach about the capacity of the world at large to participate in this, to be part of this. But at the moment, we must proclaim a reality that's very difficult to see, that this world is a kingdom with only one king, and that is our obligation. So that's the obligation, that's Aleinu. I just wanted to say something, um, it's a little addendum really, but it's about these sentences which are very, very disturbing. Um, in the Haggadah, when we open the door for Eliyahu Navi, and we say, al hagoyim shelo yoducha, Pour your anger out on the nations who don't know you. Is this a call to arms? I've been worried about this over the years. It's very shocking. It's very violent. But really it is focusing on an awareness of God and begging or asking the other nations to be aware that there is a being in the world who guides us. And if there is an ethical awareness, a social awareness, a political, economic, a spiritual awareness of that, then we don't want God to pour his anger out on those who have a sensitivity, a spiritual sensitivity, and who are affected by those things and who think about those things. But what we're saying is, shake up those who are totally immoral and unaware and insensitive to your presence. So that's the spirit in which we share this knowledge of Hashem Echad. So now we've had Aleinu, and now it's Lishabeach. Just these words. So 
What do these mean? To praise, it's our duty, le chaper, to praise the master of everything, the Adon HaKol. So now that we're aware that we bear a serious responsibility, namely to give praise to God, we can begin to appreciate to whom we're giving this obligation. So the master of everything stated here has a source in Tehillim. And David Amelech describes God as the master of all the earth. And I have it here. Um, it's very, very beautiful. I can just get it. <laughs> so uh, here it is. Um, here it is. Harim kenodag nomasu. Milifne Hashem, Milifne Adon Kol Haaretz. Mountains melt like wax before God, before the master of all the earth, Adon Kol Haaretz. And David HaMelech, I'm actually studying uh, um, Nevi'im Nevi now with in Shmuel and in detail, the life of David HaMelech. Um, hugely sensitive to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his character. So David HaMelech, when he invokes that, he actually has such a sharp perception of this. And he emphasizes the fact that God has no competition. And Masters above has largely been replaced in our days by masters below. And this is what David Hamelech is actually pointing out, that we've got political presidents, tyrannical dictators, military commanders, always his, um, his warlike engagement with the Plishtim and other hostile nations around him. God was almost um, obliterated by these nations. And in 2020, we have business magnets and crime bosses. And wherever you look, you find so-called leaders and masters. And as individuals, we often fool ourselves into thinking that we control others. In fact, nothing in creation celestial bodies above or human bodies below has any true control. And this is what this says, We bless the God of everything. Hashem alone directs and controls every single detail. And the Avut Raham says something uh, quite powerful here. He says, to believe anything else is to deny God's existence. And that's quite a powerful statement. You know, when one invests um, other important factors or people in one's life with uh, absolute ultimate controlling powers, one denies God's existence because at the end of the day, how things are gonna go are up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this is what this Shabbat Adon HaKol locks in. Anochi Hashem Elokecho from the Aseret HaDibrot. I am God. I am God, your God. And we'll speak about those two different dimensions of God in a minute. Any questions so far? Okay. La tête gdula le yatser bereshit. So it's our duty also, always back to Aleinu, <clears throat> it's our duty to ascribe greatness gdula le yatser, the former, the one who formed creation, le yatser, the creator who formed. Um, the creation, Bereshit. 
So what is this ascribing greatness? Really, really interesting. In our present generation, the word greatness is used all too freely, like the word brilliant. Everything's brilliant. Great. Yeah. We slap this label on. Um, onto the most mundane pursuits, great idea, a great book, a great person, a great computer, the world's greatest swimmer. Woo! Everything is great and brilliant. What a brilliant thing. What a brilliant. And um, so what could greatness mean then when we are applying it to the creator of the universe? Um, is it that... He is so far transcendent that he wouldn't involve himself with the lower world that he made. You know, he just um, created it. And then like the watchmaker says, yeah, great world. I'm going back to my haven above. And if something goes wrong, give me a call. I'll come and fix it. Is this the God we're talking about? Who doesn't relate to his creation? And so here <clears throat> is an incredible idea of what we actually mean by um, God's greatness. So there are two dimensions of God, Yudke Vavke, which is the one that we're used to seeing, Adonai, and Eloheinu, or Elokeinu, or Elokim. These two names of God or dimensions of God refer to two very important characteristics. The Yudke Vavke, Hashem, is God as he transcends and surrounds the worlds, the entire universe. Misaviv kol ha'olamim, God as he transcends and surrounds. Yudke Vavke. But then we have the personal aspect of God. And we say that in Shema. Let's look at this. Elokeinu. God, our personal God. And in Shema, you have these two dimensions. God as he transcends and God as he is imminent in the creation and in our personal lives. Elokim. He's imminent in the creation. He's personal to us. He is our particular hashgacha pratit, divine providence. And in the Shema, we have these two things brought together really, really amazingly well. Let's think about it. Shema Israel, Adonai Elokeinu, Adonai Echad. So Yudke Vavke is God as he surrounds the world. Elokeinu is God as he is imminent in the creation at every moment, not just when we call the watchmaker back because something has gone wrong. Imminent at every moment, like a hum, maintaining the universe at every moment. And these two dimensions of God, Hashem Echad, is his oneness. And here in Aleinu, it is his greatness. And this combination of misaviv, surrounding, and mimale, filling, combined, this is the greatness that we attest to in Aleinu. Latet gdula. This is the greatness. Liyotzer bereshit. The creator, the former of our world is still very much with us. So that's what you're saying when you say these words in Aleinu. Shalo osanu kagoye hartsot. He didn't make us like the nations of the land. Now, please let me remind you because there is a very important conceptual uh, lens that we bring to bear on this, which I discussed in the um, introduction. After the Chet Ha'egel Hazab, after the sin of the golden calf, 
the people did teshuva, as I said before, and Moshe begged Hakadosh Baruch Hu to niflenu, separate us from the nations of the world. He did not make us like the nations of the land. We are not idol worshippers. We slipped and we fell. Yes, yes. But now we want to be unique and distinguished from that. So who are these nations um, of the lands? And what does it mean that Hashem didn't make us like them? From the moment God created the world, all the world, including us, was called the nations of the land. And God originally intended that all of humanity should be brought under the wings of the Shekhinah. Shekhinah is a dimension of Hashem. Let me give you an example. It's like a very, very um, possessive mother who loves, who loves her children to the fierceness of a lioness. The Shekhinah is the a feminine aspect of God. Shekhinah, for instance, is the dimension of God which was present when the Jews crossed the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea. Fierce and loving. A gvura, a strength and, and, and a harshness, shibachesed from the kindness, from the loving heart. And the Shekhinah invited the whole of humanity to participate in becoming part of the covenant. And you know, and we'll revisit it again, when all the nations of the world were offered the Torah, and each of them asked what it had in it. I'll repeat this later on, because it's important qua translation. And they said, what? No stealing? No thanks. They said, what? No adultery? No thanks. They said, no what? No killing? Man, this is the way we live. This is the way we make our, uh, our, our, we, we make our living. Can't accept a... Uh, the Torah that, uh, that demands this kind of obligation. Now, this is very important because this Torah, this covenant, this relationship with God was offered to humanity in the beginning. Do you remember the, uh, the, the, the Sheva Mitzvot, the Bnei Noach? And we'll come to that again. The seven uh, Mitzvot that the Bnei Noach, after they came out of the Teva, the generation of Noach, were obligated to keep, they entered into a covenant with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and they were commanded to keep the, the Sheva Mitzvot, the Bnei Noach, and we'll look at that again later on in the, in the, the Aleinu, because Aleinu brings together so much of our narrative and so much of our history and, and indicates to us that um, all the nations of the world were offered the covenantal relationship between themselves and God. It's something that we choose, not only God chooses, a covenant is a mutually um, nourishing uh, relationship for the good of both partners. It's not like a social contract, which is all set about by uh, negotiations. And uh, it is a mutual agreement to work towards the flourishing of both partners or of all partners. And they were all offered that. But that wasn't their plan. It wasn't their plan. They didn't want this uh, extremely demanding and high dedication to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So Avraham Avinu really is the paradigm. We start the process of um, covenantal relationship with Avraham's Brit Mila, where he dedicated himself to God dedicated himself to the one God and spread that message. And the different, Abraham was the master, was the father of, of, of humanity and the first Jew. So there's that uh, double dimension, double role over there. It's really important to keep in mind. And 325 years after Abraham passed away. In the merit of this, the Jews appeared 
a god appeared to the Jews at Har Sinai. At the merit of this kind of dedication, it was a characteristic deeply embedded in the Jewish people. And this was the turning point of the creation where God and humankind established the covenant, a mutual relationship where heaven came down to earth, if you want, and not, and not misaviv, not surrounding, but heaven became present in earth. And the presence of God came down to the earth. This was the Torah being given. Lo bashamayim hi. The Torah is not just in heaven, says Moshe Rabbeinu to the angels who say, what is this man coming, doing nicking our stuff? And Moshe says, hold on a minute. Lo bashamayim hi. This stuff in this Torah is to do, aleinu, to do something. Okay. And on that day, we were able to perceive these two dimensions of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to choose our uniqueness and to accept, invite into our lives the master of the universe. And that's how we differ from Kagoye Ha'artzot the nations of the world. So for the first time, the Jewish nation was given the ability to achieve an intimate awareness of God in their lives. And from that point on, we would be privy to the unique perceptions of God's hashgacha pratit, his divine guidance in our lives. Um, Aleinu uh, states in its very final uh, sentence that in the messianic era, which is for everyone, the world would acknowledge this oneness. And there again, because the nations of the world, other faiths and religions and colors and creeds have the capacity, which is why I invoke Shvota Matcha. Everybody has the capacity to, to, to be included in God's covenant. This is the prayerful wish of the Aleinu. I wonder if to some extent this is uh, altering a perception um, people might have had concerning um, the very kind of um, separatist suggestions in Aleinu, that we are separate and special and no one else is included. Are these, are these explanations, um, not that I want to just bring them to, to uh, uh, delete that, but it, I do want to put uh, Aleinu in a broader context. Is this making a difference? What do people feel? Do you just have to unmute yourself if you want to speak? Question is, or do you still think of Elena as you always did? Or is this the first time that you've gone in to the explanation quite like this? Roberta. I was, uh, I was thought that that business about um, has not made us like nations of the other earth was also was always a bit oh gosh you know I hope they don't think you know if people the the going is they they're going to use this against us kind of thing and I always thought it was a bit of a thing to kind of keep quiet about somehow if you see what I mean. And is uh, is is this giving you a, a different perspective or another possibility to consider? Yes, it's a different perspective. Yes, yeah, yeah, it, yes. I hadn't thought of it that we chose it and the others didn't, but um, it always, you know, it could always be. I always thought it something that could be used against us. I mean, of course, it could without without study. Yes, not, not that one is construing these points, but one is uh, 
setting out this prayer, which, as we said in the introduction, you know, we, we take a minute to say and a lifetime to understand. Um, uh, you know, we rush it off at the end of the service and no one really uh, knows its meaning or has gone into its meaning. Mm. Denise? Um, just press your space bar. You're on mute, I think. And now you're on mute. So just take, if you press your space bar down and speak. Or if you go to the top of your square, your box, your photo box, and click unmute. Yes, we should be able to hear you. Ah, oh. is your volume up? Caroline, are you there? Caroline? Ah, oh. Caroline is hosting this. Ah, oh, this is such a shame. You have unmuted. Is is your is there a problem, Lindy? Yes, thank you. Denise's volume is not coming up, and she uh, wants to speak. She's not muted. No, I know. So maybe there's a volume control on her keyboard. Yeah, I can't do anything my end. Okay, Denise, Denise write, uh, write your question in the chat. Yeah, I do. Oops, where's Denise gone? Oh, no. I, can't see her. I can't see her. Denise, is there a picture of a microphone on the top line of your space bar? Is I just asked her to unmute herself by control. I could ask her through Zoom to unmute herself. Yes. But it has unmuted, perhaps she doesn't have volume. Does the hand have anything to do with it? The hand won't have anything to do with it. She raised her hand to ask a question, possibly. Yeah, yeah, so I've acknowledged that. Okay, Denise, you're unmuted. Oh, such a shame. Yeah. Ah, oh. oh, oh, oh. Denise. Have you got computer, have you got computer audio put on? She might not have a speaker on her computer. I'm sure she does. Oh, write your question in the chat as Alex has suggested. So sorry, when, if, if you can look at this. Um, oh, so sorry. All right. So, um, We've, we've, uh, we were talking about uh, the way in which um, uh, the Jewish, the Jews as a nation were, um, were different from Shelah, Osano, Kogoye, Hartzot, different from the other nations. And here, Velo, Samano, Kumishpachot, Adama. And God didn't position us like the families of the ground. A really, really interesting phrase, the families of the ground. This corresponds to a promise that God made Avraham Avinu in Parshat Lech Lecha. And Hashem tells Avraham, all the families of the ground will be blessed through you. Now, this phrase is a really, really interesting phrase because it refers to very, very lowly peoples who still exist in our very days. The ones who are the dirt farmers, the ones who are the nomads, the ones who are the aborigines, or other slighted groups. And they are everywhere in the 2020 world. Let's not fool ourselves. And it's one thing 
for us to recognize and and the nation sorry just wanted to and the nations of the world the people of the lands ignore them and they don't participate perhaps in the economic wealth and they don't participate in the social intercourse and they don't participate in the political negotiations or even vote and they are cast aside as the people of the ground by the nations of the land. I thought this was in an incredible thought. Because if their own nations are ignoring and disregarding them, then how does good come to them? How do they in any way participate in some kind of positive aspect, some kind of food and clothing and care? How is attention drawn to their dire straits? So it's one thing to recognize that God didn't make us like the nations of the earth, but it's another thing entirely to um, appreciate the remarkable, remarkable form of communication that we the Jewish people have with God. So in Eleno, the, the sentence, the words that God did not position us like the families of the ground, should not, not evoke any kind of um, snobism, but it should evoke a huge, huge gratitude. A tremendous gratitude since it's perhaps on our account that these people participate in any goodness or blessing at all. Because if anybody is bringing some kind of um, downflow from Hakash Baruch Hu that makes mankind successful, and the world, and I'm not saying that the world is like this, but there is part of the world which is like this, totally ignores any divine providence, any blessing, from a godly being that influences what happens down here on the earth. And the Gemara tells us that even the families of the ground are blessed on account of the acknowledgments of God. And it, it's not a, a, a boastful or um, egocentric as a people thing to allow the thought that perhaps these people, these ignored ones, receive bounty and success only because of blessings which come to the world through those who acknowledge God. And amongst those are the Jewish people. Because those ignored ones have a capacity for blessing in their own right. They are a vessel for God's blessing, but no one is blowing it their way. And so we are part of that. We are a channel of blessing for those people. Now you could say, oh yeah, show me the blessing in their lives. Show me in child prostitution, show me in all those kind of things and abused women and people who are starving, and ill, etc. Show me the blessing we bring. Could it be that the attention and the amelioration, the attention to and the amelioration, the, the amelioration of their situation is partially an ethical sensitivity, partially a drawing down a blessing from godliness. It's not enough and it never will be, or will it? So this is a very, very interesting thing to, to acknowledge that it's these people who are kelim, they are vessels for God's blessing, except they're being, they're being blocked from receiving it and it's our responsibility to see that they get it i thought that was quite um an extraordinary thought 
שלא שם חלקנו כהן. God didn't assign us a portion like this. But the first section of Aleinu states that Please put, please put on your mutes, everybody. Can you just put your mutes on to switch mutes on? So this first section of Elena states that Hashem made the Jewish people unique in many ways. First, he didn't make us like um, the nations of the world. Then he didn't position us like the people of the ground. Um, and he didn't give us a portion like this. What does this mean, a portion? The answer can be found in a verse in Yirmiyahu, and there the prophet warns us that graven images and molten idols are, could, please switch off your, could, please switch on your mute. Denise, do you have a mute there that you could switch on, please? Molten idols are vanity, the work of deception. And the chilek Yaakov, the portions given to the Jewish people are unlike these because HaKadosh Baruch as we acknowledge, is the creator of all things. I'm going to make this full screen again. Okay. All right. I can't see the participants. I can't see. Uh, is there a problem? Okay. So here we have to deal with a, a very disturbing point because this whole unique people and relationship seems to be a bit of a setup. Okay. Um. As if Ken intentionally set up the rest of humanity. So that idolatry actually became their portion. Caroline, I think you need is your Sorry, yeah, I became unmuted by accident. Sorry, I was talking to my son. Sorry. Okay. And um, in Dvarim, there is a pasuk which seems to support this idea of setup. And it reads, the sun and the moon and the stars, all the legions of the heavens, that Hashem, your God, has apportioned chalak to all the peoples under the entire heaven. So what's the Chumash suggesting? The Chumash seems to suggest that God gave the rest of the world, the forces of heaven, to prostrate to and serve. So he's actually inducting them into serving the celestial bodies. Now this is very, very shocking as the prohibition is one of the, the Sheva Mitzvot of the Bnei Noach. And we're gonna look at those now. So on the one hand, God's giving these celestial bodies to the nations of the world, seeming to encourage idol worship of the celestial beings by the idol worshippers, the sun, the moon, the stars, and natural items as well, such as stones and trees, etc., and invest them with some kind of godliness. And at the same time, the Sheva Mitzvot, the Bnei Noach, absolutely caution against it. Now, in the Chumash, we've got we need the glass. We need the glasses. <laughs> In the Chumash, we've got these Sheva Mitzvot de Bnei Noach. Avoda Zara. The first one is idolatry. Yeah. So we're looking at that in terms of what we've said: the sun, the moon, the stars, might, uh, power, and. Um, so this is the first thing that is prohibited to humanity. Sheva mitzvahs to Beno Noach is the laws given to humanity, 
there's no Jewish anything when Noach came out the Teva. And this, the Sheva um, Mitzvot of B'nai Noach form the foundation of the Aser Kadibrot and the whole of our ethical uh, way, mandate. Birkat Hashem is the second one. Blessing of the divine name. Now, Yudke, Ravke, Hashem, the divine name. Shvichut Damim, murder is prohibited. Gilui Arayot, sexual transgressions are prohibited. Gozel, theft, and the appointment of courts of law, civil law, so that the godly intention for an ethical nation is enacted on earth by courts of justice. And Dinim, setting up those courts of justice in a system. Very, very interesting. And Eiver Min Hachai, eating a limb which is torn from a living animal. So in those days there was uh, hunting and um, eating um, in, in a way that was sar um, bale chayim, cruel to the animal world. So the, the nations of the world had this. And so And, 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 so, and so what was the, what, I've lost my track. Ah, oh, yes. So in Yirmiyahu, um, the prophet warns us that graven images and molten idols are vanity. So that's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And here is the disturbing point that we then have to negotiate about how the nations of the world were offered celestial beings and other, uh, and other objects of idol worship to, to, uh, it, to imbue with godliness. But the truth is that God didn't actively provide the nations with celestial forces in, as an object of worship. But at the same time, and here's the rub, he didn't stop them from pursuing this path. And the active dynamic that comes in here with them and with us is free will. Everything is under the control of Hashem. Chutz mi yirat shamayim. And the exception of that is fear of heaven. Okay, so we have to choose whether we are going to follow God's ways or not. And this is our free will. Oh, yes, you could say God knows in the end what we will choose, but he doesn't push us towards it. We have to choose this. And so he didn't stop the nations of the world from pursuing this path, but they didn't need to choose that. And the word, chalak, chelkeinu, the portion, the word chalak, from, which is the source of Chalkeinu, on one level means he divided, he apportioned, and it can also mean slippery or smooth. We talk about something in Kashrut, where um, in Glat Kasher, everything has to be Chalak, the lung has to be Chalak, it has to be without blemish, it has to be very smooth, smooth and slippery. So the celestial forces, by virtue of the fact that they were there, became a slick surface on which human beings could slip and stumble into worshipping false gods. And this is based on the age-old adage, is a person is helped along the path that he chooses to go. And we have to take responsibility for that. However, the portion of Jews is Hashem. And that's our Chalkeinu, and we acknowledge that. We are better able to steer clear of these false substitutes and pursue a path that leads directly to the source of fulfillment because we remind ourselves that we have a covenantal relationship with the creator of everything.
let me know if you have had enough. <laughs> Robbie, you're going to say something. You're mute. Take yourself off mute. Forgive me, but I have to go on to another Zoom at 12. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. I, I don't want to be rude, but I'm sorry. I really have to go. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. You. Would you like to go on, people, or would you like to ask questions? Silence. I'm happy to go on. Francis? Uh, yes, I, oh, excuse me. <coughs> I'm, I'm happy to go on for another few minutes. I have to leave here at about 12.30. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm okay for another 10 minutes, maybe. All right. So let's just use, I mean, they're complicated um, explanations and it's quite dense. I mean, I, I just, I, you know, I, has it been useful? I just need to take a sounding. It's given me uh, a better understanding, for sure. Um, but I, uh, yeah, some of some of it is is kind of sinking in, and other parts of it I need more time to kind of get to grips with, if if you like. Um, as I said to you last week, um, I sadly because i don't i'm not that fluent in reading hebrew i do tend to read i start off in the hebrew and then i go over to the english so i'm i'm kind of i suppose more used to reading the english and taking it in obviously your explanation has given me a much more in depth understanding of it um, and I felt that I wanted to read it in English because I wanted to understand it oh. uh, and, and I accept what you said last week about you know trying to learn the next sentence and then in Hebrew and then being familiar with that and going on but for me uh, the you know my, my norm is to start off in the Hebrew and then swing over to the English, and I do understand some of it, but obviously your explanation of that has made it far different, has, has given me a, a more in-depth understanding of, of even the English. Okay, so thank you. I, I think what, what might be a good idea um, is for people to jot down questions um, from today, if you have any, just to, um, so that we can discuss them afterwards, um, or if not, not. Um, it, it's interesting, um, this next section, Vagaraleinu kachal ba'maynam. Where are we? Vagaraleinu, I've got that. Vagaraleinu kachal ba'maynam. The translation of this is and um, a goral you see there, like a lottery. A lot, <laughs> a lot. That's really interesting because in today's Chumash, when, um, the, uh, when after the Jews had come into Israel um, and the previous generations had died off in the wilderness, uh, Moshe apportioned uh, the, the sections of the land by lot and the lot had a voice very extraordinary it was learn the Rashi to say that there was a miraculous um, intervention in deciding geographically which 22 and 23,000 people which part of the earth that which part of the uh, Eretz HaKadosh Israel they would they would uh, inherit and then the next and the next and there were these huge numbers and of course this is when the the famous story of the daughters of Tzlachad come in and they are as women um, inheritors of a certain portion because they were Tzlachad's daughters he didn't have sons it's a brilliant piece um, and so here we are talking about um, a lot. Our, is it a lottery? <laughs> the divine intervention? Now, um, I, you said 10 minutes, and uh, that is 
absolutely the maximum that this will take. But here I am going to read directly from the uh, Abdurrahman because he just has uh, an amazing uh, kind of uh, take on this and a story which I think we could benefit from. So I'm going to read directly. So the Goraleinu Cholam Hamonam is our lot is not like is not like the multitudes, the lot of the multitudes. Abdurrahman says the following. Imagine the following scenario. You arrive at a lavish banquet in honor of the king. The hall is packed with strangers and after a few seconds, you feel a hand tapping your shoulder. And it's none other than the king, the host himself. Welcome, my dear friend, he says to you, I've been waiting for you. Come and sit with me at the head table. You appreciate your good fortune as you receive the royal escort. All eyes follow as you make your way to the head table and spread before you are the delicacies as far as the eye can see. Go ahead, says the king proudly, take the best portion. But you look more closely at the dishes, something's not right. Um, you then spot the sign that reads, caution, several of these entrees contain poison. You hesitate wondering what kind of buffet this is. Meantime, the king by your side is awaiting your decision and you want to choose something good, but you're in a quandary. The bad looks good and the good might be bad. King sees you having a bit of trouble deciding what to do and reassuringly he grabs hold of your hand and forces it into the selection of a few morsels. Take those, he encourages. They are delicious. <coughs> the above anecdote is based on a medrash. So the verse in Tehillim in which David HaMelech relates that God has lowered his hand onto my lot. Look, I, I, I wanted to read you these in Hebrew, but I, I do have them, but I think we'll just, for speed's sake, we will just take the English. So the king represents God. His dear friend is the Jewish people. The feast represents our world, which lacks absolutely nothing and is filled with both good and harmful things. The king sees his friend eyeing the best portion, which means that Hashem realizes the neshama, the soul of a Jewish person, wants to do good and wants to live. However, because the powerful yetahara, the negative inclination, impairs all human beings' ability to discern between spiritually, spiritually healthy and spiritually harmful, it's necessary for the king to push us towards a good portion. The choice of life, over chata b'chayim, you choose life as opposed to the bad, the choice of death. We require encouragement despite the Torah's warning, I've placed life and death before you. I've placed blessing and curse before you. And you shall choose life. There's a mandate almost to choose life. And Varim says it's the Feirush, exactly um, where um, I've placed before you this day curse and death and blessing and life. Choose life. But then the choice, as we've said in the explanation before, is up to us because there's free will. So the Avodraham says there are two difficulties in the understanding of this verse. First, how can choosing between life and death be considered a choice? Does this really require any forethought? Second, it, yeah, I mean, do we, do we, do we actually want to choose death? I mean, some, well, some might. Yes, we sadly know some might. Second, why do we need to be instructed to choose life? When offered a choice between life and death, who would select death? And the answer to these questions becomes clear when we look at life and death in spiritual terms. So the Vudraham goes on, our value as human beings is based on uh, free will. Free will. 
Hashem actually choice, really, decision. Hashem actually gives us the choice of whether we want to be alive or dead. And if life is truly meaningful, only when we choose it, then death has to be a viable alternative because it's valuable only if we choose it. This is, has tremendous ripples, doesn't it? This is why HaKadosh Baruch Hu has made the choice of death in spiritual matters a very attractive option. Any choice that draws us away from God is a vote for death. Shoo, la la. Only Avodraham could say that. <laughs> for example, um, if you're insulted by someone, even though it may feel great to lash back in anger, you're actually choosing a form of death. And although it may be fun to tell a hilarious joke at someone else's expense, this also is a kitten to death. You are killing in, in inverted commas that p person. Likewise, forbidden relationships, while they might provide temporary pleasure, can cause spiritual death and physical death between other relationships and you or yourself. In fact, the death option can become so appealing one might actually despair of the ability to gain real life. So we can now understand the necessity of God telling us to choose life. Oi, mate, step out of it. Look at what you're doing. He must reassure us that we are indeed capable of overcoming the powerful attraction to choose death. These are conversations that we've had in the community, Shlomo and I, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. With this as a backdrop, we can now appreciate our lot, our privileged situation is not like their multitudes, unless they acknowledge the covenantal relationship, which is theirs to choose. And as Jews, we have an advantage because God places our hand on a good portion like the mashal, like the story of the king who forces, who puts the guest's hand on the non-poisoned, the good options. God will do everything short of making the choice for us to encourage and help us to attain true good by assisting us via hashgacha pratit, particular divine providence in all our situations. We have to see it, we have to look for it, we have to be prepared to suspend our judgment and allow it. Sometimes we know unpleasant experiences can propel a person forward positively. And the whole world is orchestrated in a way to enable Jewish people to acquire the good life in both this world and the world to come. As long as God detects that somewhere deep within us, says the Abu Dhaham, we are striving for this relationship, our relationship with him. Even in the darkness, even in the blackness, God will guide us to eternal life. I'm going to end on, on a difficult note. There's always a question of where Rahman Litzlan's suicides will be buried. They are buried in the same Beta Kvaret, not outside it. Very important. There is even in the last the possibility for Shova. And that is my share for today. Sorry to end on a 
note like that, but it's critical. Okay.